Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with uh, Glenn Truitt, David Halsey from Ideal Business Partners. We're going to talk a little bit about the business of medicine. For those of you that are new to the show, we broadcast live here in the studio every single Friday, every single Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we bring in guests to the show that talk about things such as innovation in healthcare, medical education, medical development, medical tourism, and just folks that are doing things to improve the quality of health right here in Southern Nevada in keeping with the mission of Las Vegas Hills. In the studio today, again, we've got uh, Glenn Truitt and David Housey. Welcome to the studio, guys. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so we're anxious to hear and learn a little bit more about Ideal Business Partners. It seems like a unique business bringing together both the finance accounting side of the house as well as health law. So if one of you wants to start, you could just give us a high level of Ideal Business Partners and what that looks like. Sure. Uh, well, we are a multidisciplinary professional practice that specializes in healthcare. Um, I'm, a, I'm a healthcare attorney. I've been one for 12 years. Uh, and my partner, David, is a finance specialist uh, and uh, we have a, we have a little trouble always describing what it is that, that David does. Um, it's sort of a mixture of uh, sort of professional banking, financial management, management prof- you know sort of development of models, and he sits above your accountant basically. And and but uh, important to healthcare. Exactly. At the end of the day, it's it's critical to healthcare. Exactly. And then the combination of those is sort of the strategy element. We we bring those together, take them out of their silos, and then work together to develop strategies for business, healthcare business owners to be successful. Yeah. And do you guys focus on just like the small business, the medium-sized business? What's that range? I would say we mostly avoid the, you know, the institutional, you know, so no, no hospital business really. They usually okay. have their own in-house attorneys or their large national networks. Uh, so from your, your group, large group practices down to your solo practitioner and some of the ancillary healthcare businesses like medical spas or uh, uh, other sort of healthcare adjacent businesses as well, yeah. medical, medical billing and things that you wouldn't think of as like uh, medical, because like heels, we'd rather be inclusive than exclusive when it comes to who we're servicing. The healthcare ecosystem has, has grown quite wide and we want to be able to service all those businesses because they really do work together to make healthcare successful in the market. Cool. So David, you're a CPA by trade. Tell us a little bit about that. I am. Um, I was in public accounting back in the early 90s, and I've since worked in commercial banking, investment banking, equity research, and I've been the uh, president of a public company in consumer goods, as well as a COO and CFO of an IT company. And now I'm specializing with Glenn um, in healthcare because at the end of the day, medical businesses are businesses. And although there's some peculiarities uh, with healthcare businesses, um, the, the, the basic structure of the business is the same. So is it fair to say that uh, business is the business thought process is many times missing from the business of healthcare? Yes, as it is with other entrepreneurs. So, sure. you know, uh, small single practitioners and small group practices and, and even to the ASCs. And we worked with the uh, largest private ASC um, in the city are very entrepreneurial and they have, you know, people come and they do. They're excellent at their technical skill, mm-hmm. but they're not good at managing the business that does that technical skill. So behind the scenes, you guys kind of provide that infrastructure in terms of the accounting finance side and Glenn providing some legal counsel and and guidance uh, to their legal matters. Exactly. I I think a lot of people misunderstand what uh, what healthcare lawyers really do. They think of us as uh, malpractice. That's what people think about when they think about doctors and the law. And obviously that that is an important element of, of of the healthcare practice. But we don't litigate, and, and we believe that the litigation is sort of a last resort. Although, you know, when you need it, it's good to have somebody. And we certainly have people that we work with and trust. But the reality is, just like doctors preach that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, the exact same thing is true when it comes to your compliance and, and your other legal efforts, uh, paperwork and documentation and structuring your, your practices. And when practices come together, when they get bought and sold, when you exit, all even hiring key individuals, all these things are legal maneuvers, none of which involve a courthouse. And all all of which should include an attorney. So teaching the community how to access our, our service is really a large part of, of what we do on, on a day-to-day basis and a large part of why we've des- decided to associate with Las Vegas Heels is that it's about education and without education, there, there, there can be no success. So we, we're excited to be a part of the Heels family and, uh, and excited to continue to educate uh, doctors and proprietors of healthcare businesses what they didn't learn in medical school or their professional schooling. And that's how to actually run their business in a successful way and uh, all the way to retirement. 
So you've been in health law. How did you get into health law? How does one step into that arena? <laughs> well, well, I always say I always say that the the, the no health law, no healthcare lawyers come out of law school, um, and for that matter, very few transactional lawyers come out of law school. So you know, you don't find your practice; your practice finds you. Uh, as I worked for a, a large. Uh, law firm down in, in Los Angeles, I found myself with uh, pharmacy clients and other, and other healthcare related clients. And I really enjoyed um, helping them navigate the very perilous sort of uh, regulatory minefield that surrounded their business for successful transactions. Uh, and, I, and I really enjoyed that. And so I had no, if you would have told me in law school that I would be a healthcare attorney, I would have laughed you out of the room. Uh, but it, I came to really enjoy the practice. And it was very, it's, a, it's very much a problem solving and creative enterprise to work in healthcare. And that suits my skill set from, um, you know, from my undergraduate degree in mathematics to my military experience. All these are sort of creative, you know, making the best of your resources and working with highly skilled individuals, all those things really ma- matched into a healthcare practice and working with uh, owning physicians. So, uh, and I've really enjoyed it. And I've seen all different sides from in-house and now uh, servicing at, with a boutique. I really enjoy working with uh, physicians and healthcare business owners because they, although they want to make money, um, they, they're serving the community in a way that, that really no one else can. And we take it for granted uh, what a robust uh, healthcare community means for us, but we're a, we're a pretty healthy community. And, and I think we have the local healthcare community to ask to, to you know, to, to really to, to thank for that because a lot of communities, you go back East and the Midwest, they're not healthy communities. You walk around Las Vegas, it's a pretty healthy looking community. Uh, and, and our life expectancy is higher than, than, than average. And you know, people think of Las Vegas as a certain thing. And, and it is that thing in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, this is a robust and healthy and family-based you know, community that revolves around, uh, you know, wellness and health in a way that a lot of you know, other communities do not. So I really, I'm grateful to work with the community and grateful to work with, uh, to be a, uh, you know, a healthcare attorney in a place where there aren't that many because we really are doing good. Yeah. Healthcare seems to be thriving in Las Vegas. We've had a lot of growth over the last couple of years, obviously with the expansion of graduate medical education, bringing on the UNLV school of medicine, Gosh, we we're, we're building a hospital every couple of years. There's mm-hmm. just a lot going on in town. Yeah, we were health. I would like to say we were healthcare before healthcare was cool. Uh, I think that's always the case when the, the market turns towards something and the people, the stakeholders that are already there, uh, and we see a lot of interest now. That we've had a lot, we've had a lot of inquiries from attorneys trying to come into the space. I think there's there are 5,800 you know doctors in Southern Nevada or 5,000 in Southern Nevada, 4,000 4, in Southern Nevada. We you know we can't <laughs> possibly service them all with our with our boutique, sure. and so the, I, I'm hopeful that the the legal community will begin to understand, you know, the needs of, of the healthcare community and begin to serve them robustly. Because although I'm, I'm happy to work at the pace we're working, like we certainly can't service them all. Yeah. Healthcare is obviously unique. So David, you've been a CPA 14, 15 years. What brought you into healthcare? It's not something that you just stumble upon. You've worked in public companies, IT companies, service-based companies, consumer-based companies. Why healthcare? Yeah, well, um, yeah, that's true. I've worked in a lot of verticals, and uh, mostly because I partnered with Glenn. And you know, the the, uh, the peculiarities of healthcare are a lot more robust on the uh, legal and compliance side than they are on the finance side. Um, but there, there certainly are some. One of the main concerns, uh, one of the main issues you'd work at uh, as a CFO in a different kind of company is product pricing. And for the most part, you know, the insurance reimbursements are set and you, yeah. you don't get to set your price. So you have to work that equation from a different direction uh, to find out, you know, what the capacity is, the utilization and how to make the most of your space, make the most of your staff. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in it because it's a it's a robust industry um, and it's good. And like Glenn was saying, you know, it's like it's, it's nice to serve uh, doctors who serve the community and provide a, a you know, a societal good. Um, but the doctors can't do that if they don't have success in their own practices, yeah. if they're busy remediating. You touched on a huge topic for Las Vegas Heels, and that's reimbursements. It's an area that we're tackling, we're taking on this year in a very, very big way. Uh, I think we're getting support. Obviously, the uh, the mayor, Mayor Goodman, brought that up in her st- State of the City address, how important Medicaid reimbursements are, uh, just because our doctors just are not getting paid enough. Uh, we've got some primary care guys that are struggling to make ends meet. And so a lot of us started focusing on the cost side of the equation. And, you know, what are those expenses? What do they look like? And how do we tackle that? Because if we could reduce that expense, uh, that dollar drops quicker to the doctor's pocket uh, than increasing the revenue side of the house where they're getting these reimbursements that many times don't even cover the cost. Mm-hmm. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you work with the practices. Obviously, bringing in a CPA and a, a deep financial background, when you sit down with a practice, this, what, what do you what do you tackle first? What do you look at? Goals. The first thing is we look at is goals. So it's well, brand is first. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? Who are you? Uh, what is your culture? How do you present yourself to your patients, to your staff, 
and and to the community. So that's that's one thing that can't be uh, violated. So it's brand goals, data process, and reporting. And then we get into um, you know more granular stuff. Um, reports exactly is you know almost all financial reporting and medical practices is terrible. Like like yeah, just uh, terrible. They yep. don't they don't get what they need. And, you know, there's two, two ways to use financial reports. One is for compliance. Yeah, you can use it to pr- prepare a tax return at the end of the year. And the other is managerial. And managerial is uh, reports that help you make decisions. And that's what they don't have. And so they have to wing it. And they have to go by feel. And, it's, you know, we say science first, art second. You do the math, then you make your decision. And so we go and we start, you know, with the chart of accounts and the way that uh, the, that the, the statements are built. And after you have good data, then you can move further down to, I mean, uh, capacity, utilization, and sometimes the practice just doesn't make sense with a single provider, and sometimes it needs more providers. Sometimes it needs more exam rooms uh, or procedure rooms. And sometimes, you know, we talk about uh, outsourcing billing. It's like, does it make sense to have it in-house or have it out out, out of the house? Um, And sometimes, you know, you might take the place that you're billing staff is working and you can put two more procedures rooms and ha- maybe even have another provider. So it's it's making the most of the infrastructure that you have and then considering whether or not you need to increase or change your infrastructure. So if you had to look back, what is the single largest challenge or the single largest issue that a practice faces that you're able to tackle? You know, they we always look up and we go, there's that one route. If I could get to that and fix that, what is that one challenge? Uh, how the doctor spends his day or her day. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's the first thing. You know, it's one of the um, principal tenants from uh, Peter Drucker is, you know, know your time and how you mm-hmm. spend it and where, where, where money is made. You know, we tell our doctors that, you know, you're going to make more money in the boardroom than you will in the operating room. Mm-hmm. You know, getting out of the business and working on the business instead of in the business. So it's really... It's the it's the entrepreneur's time, the physician's time, um, what they do and, and how they do it. Yep. So when you discover that they need to build their practice a little bit different, is that when you come in, Glenn, that you say, hey, let me help you out with some of that structuring? I, it is in, in a lot of ways that just kind of reinforcing the idea that they can do a lot more than they think they can do. I, mm-hmm. I think that uh, there's a conservatism that pervades when, when uh, and it can feel like it's like you're up against the world as, as a physician, especially if you're in a solo practice and there are slings and arrows coming from all directions, uh, you know, regulatory agencies, the market, the market in general, your patients, uh, and just understanding that you're not in as small of a box as you think, just because you've seen it done a certain way, or you've seen it, you've seen it done a certain way all around you doesn't mean that you're Constricted by that, the, the beauty of healthcare is that although it is a, a very highly regulated space and maybe the most highly regulated space in, in American industry, there's a great deal of creativity available to you if you just, you know, work with the right people and open your mind to what's 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 what's, what's possible. And I think we help them understand that um, we can help you do the things you think are, are difficult or impossible and do them in a legal way and, and open their mind to what they could create. And once you give them that ability to, to sort of create and think about what they really want to accomplish with their practice, then comes the work of making sure that it's legal because there are temple regulations that govern healthcare that are very serious and have you know extraordinary uh, implications and very high stakes. So once the, once the work, the creative work is done, then comes the work to, to build it in a way that that's compliant so that you build something great and it doesn't get torn down down the next day when you get your first audit. So a lot of what we do is to um, to evaluate, you know, get the idea, talk about goals, what do you want to accomplish, plan it out, then make sure we can do it. And then it goes back to David's side of the house. And I always say, I'm the can you and David's the should you. And uh, usually the, you know, the should you is a lot sexier than the can you. you know, we'll, we'll get through the black letter law, we'll have a plan and a structure and we'll, we'll make, a, make a, a diagram, we'll explain how it works. But then the question is, am I going to make any money and am I going to make what I expect to make with this or am I going to just break even? Sometimes an idea that feels very good and you think is going to be very profitable for you, turns out it's going to break you even because of the cost that you didn't think about that are involved and maybe it doesn't, you know, you don't get as much economy of scale with your current practice of what you added on. And and David's, uh, you know, the unique thing about working with a guy like David is that I can actually answer that question in-house. Yes, you can, but no, you shouldn't. And and then let's move, or, or maybe how could we tweak this so that you should? And and having access to those levers really uh, increases, dramatically increases the chances of success with, with anything that a doctor wants to do. Yep. So I'm going to ask you kind of the same point of question I asked David. What is the single largest 
uh, health law challenge that gets dropped on your desk every single day. Besides med mal, and I'm sure you don't do <laughs> no, litigation. No. <laughs> but, you know, what's the one thing that you go, wow, this is the area that if I had to tackle inside of every single practice, this is the first place that I go. Yeah, I know. I wish it were, were more fantastically complex than this, but I think it's I think it's cybersecurity. I, I think that I think there's a I, I had a a doctor tell me, Glenn, I, I've never, I've never even heard of anybody that's had this problem. As the, as though a, a physician's, you know, a peer group would be enough to say it's not going to happen to anyone. It's it's the same sort of thing that physicians always cringe at when they say, well, I don't know anybody that's got cancer. I don't know anybody this has happened to. Therefore, I see no risk. So. Telling them, look, you know, eighty-eight percent of the, of the targets of ransomware are, are healthcare businesses. Your value, you know, your your healthcare uh, information is worth ten times what your credit card information is worth, and your system is woefully outdated. Uh, and and almost, you know, physicians hate spending money on IT, which I understand because no one likes to spend money on IT. It just seems physicians really don't like it, and so trying to convince them that they have a real and appreciable risk because they get the risk of, of malpractice. For, for, they really understand that because they can insure it. And they, they get the risk of noncompliance. They don't always understand the risk uh, of cybersecurity and what it means to them. And I think you know if, if I could impress upon them how grave the concern is and how high the stakes are, because I can, I can save you from, from a letter from, from OSHA. I can save you from a letter from CMS. I can save you from, a hip, from, from an audit. But that cybersecurity risk, that's oftentimes fatal. It's a, it's a single fatal blow to your business. And very little that I can do after the fact can, can bring that back. And so a lot of times prevention is nicer than cure, and I'm happy to do both. Oftentimes with cybersecurity, there is no act, you know, viable cure. It's just, or it's postmortem. We're just burying your business peacefully. So, I, you know, I, that's really the thing: is that cybersecurity has become a more robust threat, much more quickly than we could have imagined, and healthcare has become far and away the the the, the biggest and juiciest target for for cyber criminals. And so, I think, you know, it's not necessarily uh, sexy to talk about, but that is that is probably the number one thing from the law side. David, it looks like you got something to contribute yeah, there. Yeah, Glenn brings up a good point is, is uh, risk, generally uh, risk. You know, so we work a lot with um, our clients on exit planning and building enterprise value because, you know, that's what, you know, business owners work for is an exit and that's their main asset. And there's three components of building enterprise value, and that's uh, growth, returns, and risk. And the risk part is probably the most overlooked part of that. And as you can have a very profitable practice with a great, you know, growth history and growth trajectory – but the risk that it all gets shut down by, you know, a regula- regulator or, um, you know, a, a cyber hacker or something like that is is very great or lose your employees. I mean, risk comes in many flavors, um, but it's, it's a huge issue that really contributes to a depression of enterprise value and the possibility of exiting at all. And we see a lot of doctors just end up closing their doors and, you know, taking their you know, especially the PI guys, the uh, personal injury guys with their liens, and just retiring on the book of liens that they have, and it's a yeah. tragedy. Yeah, it's bad. So let's take a deeper dive on ideal business partners. Mm-hmm. It's a unique structure. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it before. Uh, how did you come up with the idea? What does it look like? Tell us a little bit about the organization, and and really, I'm the why. How did it come together? Well, when I uh, when I first invited uh, David to to partner with me, I wrote up a manifesto of what I thought the practice should should look like, um, and why I wanted to come together with with a quantitative expert like David. Uh, and I always felt there was when I would counsel uh, my healthcare clients, there was something missing in the in what I call it the quant, which is sort of the you know, valuing everything and putting the numbers in because it's all well and good to have a great document, but if the numbers are wrong, then they're wrong. And, and the best I could do was guess. And I got, and I was very frustrated with trying to partner uh, in a, in a sort of a arm's length way with with accountants, there was always this odd, inexplicable conflict between lawyers and accountants. They, they, there shouldn't be a conflict there. They're not they're not on opposite sides of any appreciably identifiable issue. They're just competitive for for business in general. And so I thought, what if we could put an accountant across the hall? From from a healthcare attorney, what if we could find some you know some level of symbiosis with with our two professional practices and how that might look for for physicians uh, and and then you know I coming from the Bay Area for for law school and really under really appreciating that creative environment that 
Google and Apple and Yahoo and, and similar companies have created, Zynga, visited all those campuses as a law student and really thought, I sh- uh, if I get a chance to build a law firm, this is how I want to do it. I want there to be whiteboards everywhere, or there's footballs and soccer balls, and there's no mahogany anywhere in sight. And so you come to the spaces, you know, and as you've been, there's, you know, there's an air hockey table, there's a game room, uh, there's, there, is no, there are no wood paneling anywhere. It's, it's, it's creative. There are whiteboards in every, every space. As man- I mandated that pretty early on. Um, and you often find us in, in together in groups, uh, meeting and discussing or think tanking ideas. And that's not what you see normally. A law firm is a lot of closed doors and lawyers by themselves and, and, you know, paralegals and other assistants attending to them as needed. And it's not like that at all. The workflow is, is very communal. Um, it's very open. You know, we spend, uh, I like to say that nothing, no law gets practiced with the door closed. You know, the, the law gets practiced with the door open and then at, you know, the door closes when you have to do sort of the, you know, paper it up and, you know, actually lawyer it up, but the real work gets done in, in groups. And so it's collaborative, much in the same way the Heels organization is in your spaces. It's open. Doors are open. People are communicating ideas. That's how great things get done. We feel the same way about our professional practice. And so I think, you know, it's become much more of a, of a tech company feel, even though it is, you know, it is still a professional practice and, and the stakes are quite high. And, and all the people in there are highly qualified, highly energetic, super motivated people. And we, and it's, I, I've had my associates tell me, although we, I did no exercise at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. Cause I just thought, I just thought so hard today. I just, I thought so hard about all this stuff and I just want to go home and, you know, and watch network television, which is you know, no knock network television, but you know, you can, you can switch off for that, you know? So, um, so really a chance to, to, you know, to watch smart people engage their, you know, their intellect in a, in a meaningful way. It's a pretty cool place to hang out. And I will say to, to doc, you know, to doctors who normally hate going to their law office. And I totally get that because I hate going to my lawyer's office, but they find that they spend quite a bit more time down at the office and they enjoy it more than, 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 than us meeting in their office, even though, you know, we're happy to do that because it's a, it's a space where they can be creative, where they can be listened to, where they can have an intelligent discussion that's really not accessible in a lot of other spaces that they work in. Oftentimes they're on an island and they're dictating and no one's helping them. No one's giving them ideas and feedback. And so it's really a, it's a pretty cool uh, uh, space to see you know, sort of these think tanks, professional think tanks happen in. And I've always, I see deep down, always wanted to be a part of a think tank when I was a kid. Like that's the best job in the world. Like you can just join a think tank and that's your actual job. So, so that's kind of what we've created. And I think that, you know, I would encourage anybody to come down that has that, you know, that's has the thinking about a problem there, have a concern, come down, spend an hour with us on the house. Um, and let's talk about it. Yeah, your office is very Zappo-ish. Uh, <laughs> yes. When I went there the first time, I had big beanbag chairs yeah. everywhere. and We just don't offer tours yet. <laughs> <laughs> no tours yet, no. And we share the same uh, conference room table. That's what I admire. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yes. that, round, yeah. that round table, lots of work gets done there. Well, yeah. Well, no, putting people in an environment in those, you know, it, you know, it seems simple, but those uh, psychologically, putting people in circles rather than in lines and... Yeah, uh, um, it's not you know it's not pedagogical. It's 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 communal. It's it's about sharing ideas and and you get up on the board and and you and you put something on there in the whiteboard and then you sit down and someone adds to it and a lot of times you leave the room with a very different idea and answer than than you came in the room with and we've done that. I've I'm, I've lost count of how many times we've done that. Come in the room thinking I'm I'm here to validate what I think. And then I leave the room with with a not only just a different idea, but but a, a complete 180. Like we were, we were going to tell a client to buy a building, and we left an hour and a half later with absolutely convinced they shouldn't buy the building. Um, and that to me is 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 evidence of, of what happens in the room. And I think that's I think a cool experience for anybody, even for the people that work there. We I enjoy it a great deal, but I think for clients that come in, it's so new to them they just didn't know that was even available. Like they could even have access to a think tank uh, at their business. It really is think tank. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. It's like a lot of times we have a lot of ah. Aha moments with clients where, you know, we're knocking it around. They're, you know, participants, critical participants in the discussion. And there'll just be a moment where they're like, ah, I get it. I get it. Yep. Okay. And then, or it might just be their idea. They, they pick up in what's going around and. And that's that. That's the di- dynamism of uh, of the sharing of the ideas. And that's 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 where the name comes from. The ideal business partners is that you 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 come in and you're a part of it. This is a partnership maneuver. It's not a and it's not a concierge service where you drop your problem off in an envelope and then come back two days later and it's all fixed and here you go. Um, 
it's it's participation and the and the more participation we get from from the the principal and the physician the the better the outcomes are and and they find that uh, they they get more out of it we don't let them black box us we don't let them say my lawyer does that i don't know anything about it. that's if you if you read the e myth that's that's abdication not 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 delegation that's giving it to someone and never looking at it again is not not a way you you lead that's not it's not it's not successful it's not healthy so our our clients become pretty conversant in the law and pretty conversant in finance that's working with us. And they're much more confident in their own business and negotiations and don't need us to hold their hand very often because after a certain amount of time working with us, they've picked up the key elements uh, and they're, and they're very, they're very capable of handling minor sort of, you know, conflict resolution or problem solving without having us having to be there because we've given them the tools to understand what, what to do. And, and even when they, when, they, when they, if they can't, they know when it's time to call us and they know what we're going to do and how long it's going to take. And so all that uncertainty and anxiety that normally accompanies working with professionals is con- totally gone. And they're, they're quite comfortable, I think. And I think it's, if you, if you were to come in and see it and, and you, you see our clients come in, it doesn't feel like sort of the dentist office feel. We love our dentist, but the dentist office feel coming to your lawyer like, I'm here. Uh, I had a 10 o'clock appointment. How quick can I get out of here? That's sort of, that's sort of like begrudging. I have to be here thing is completely gone from our office. And they're like, okay, let's get to it. And, and they're, you know, they're, no, I don't need any coffee. I'm good. And uh, I think it's pretty, it's, it's, it's more fun for for me, I think, to not have someone always meet me in, with that sense of foreboding of what's what like what awful thing am I going to have to listen to today at my lawyer's office? Yeah, well, we're there to talk about their business, so it's yeah. you know it's a topic. It's you know it should be their favorite topic or close to the favorite. Yeah, it's topic. A, it's so a king holding a court. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where they they sit at the head of the table and it's like a cabinet. You know, the president and the cabinet. We sit down the table and we have a we have, we have an agenda and presentation, and we're working through a problem. And they're really directing it like a conductor. They're not playing an instrument, but they're in charge of the band, and they really enjoy that feeling because they don't get that at their office. They don't have they have a they have a team of of, of, of professionals to, but there's people that are working in their business, not on their business, and. The where else can they get a team to work on their business? And it's really only, you know, one of the few places it happens is, is in our offices, and they, they, it's refreshing for them. That's big. I want to touch on two more points because we're getting down to the bottom of the half hour. So okay. I, it looks like we're going to have to do another show <laughs> specifically on the educational series, which is what we wanted to talk about, but right. don't have a lot of time. So let's talk on this. Tell me a little bit about the practice. How many people are over there? You've got a bunch of attorneys. You've got a doctor on staff. We do. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. We've got, we've got, so we've got, uh, our, what's five lawyers, uh, yeah. two paralegals and one physician. One of our, one of our clients liked us so much that he joined the practice as a consulting physician. Dr. Stephen Cosmary, uh, was one of my first clients in Las Vegas and who truthfully didn't want to work with a lawyer at all when I met him. Um, and now, you know, he has an office in my office. Um, and I think, uh, the Medici effect, which is a, a very popular book and it's one of the books we give out during our series. Uh, but it talks about sort of the, the value of bringing people from disparate backgrounds and, and sort of, uh, uh, educational and social and cultural backgrounds together to create new ideas and having a doctor always present is very helpful for us to make sure we're always vetting things against, you know, our clients. He represents in a lot of ways, our clients viewpoints and, and how they think about things. And he can say, Hey, hold up guys. Like doctors don't know this word, you know? So where we say malfeasance all the time, he's like, doctors don't know this word. So we back that out. That's, you know, sometimes we're, we're with as many lawyers as we have, we forget that they don't, we don't all speak the same language because we speak it to one another and having a doctor to say, hold up, because there's plenty of language that doctors speak that we don't, and they're happy to dumb that down for the professionals. Like, no, I don't know what that. You know, there are a lot of words, and uh, we we do the same with with uh, him and and having. Um Again, and our our and we have a we have a law clerk who's taking the bar uh, this next month in February who's got a PhD and a master's in uh, oncology, you know, oncology and drug design uh, and and having that on staff and and we've got people from uh, from a bankruptcy background um, bankruptcy practice and oil and gas practice and and different law schools in different parts of the country and and diff- way different undergraduate backgrounds and everybody comes together in this sort of soup of of very you know sort of just wildly disparate backgrounds to create uh, a, a very unique environment. So we're definitely going to have to have another show because we did not touch on the educational series, which is big. Yes, it's uh, huge. So at a high level, uh, we've got like two minutes. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the educational series. And then after that, if you could let our audience know how to get in contact with you. And on the next show, which we will do, we'll talk a little bit more about the syllabus, the program that's going to happen, and we'll actually have a calendar that yep. we could present to everybody. So give us a high level of this educational series. Right. We... we uh 
we, we came with uh, to de- develop the Executive Healthcare MBA, which is a right now a 12-topic uh, biweekly course to teach doctors how to run their businesses from the finance part, which is an, an enterprise value, down to uh, HIPAA and Stark and kickback compliance. Uh, a 30-minute seminar followed by a 30-minute live Q&A, sh- a small group, direct Q&A with the presenting professional. Uh, and it's an extraordinary opportunity to get business education through your Las Vegas Heels membership to really get something valuable uh, out of it. And we're excited to partner with, with your group, Doug, and, and to present that in the coming weeks. So let's plan on getting you back on the show in a couple weeks. Let's lay that whole program out so our audience can learn a little bit about that. In the meantime, we need to wrap up the show. I want to thank everybody for joining us here on Inside Medicine and another wonderful episode with the folks from Ideal Business Partners. Tune back in in the next couple weeks and we will have Glenn and David back on the show to tell us a little bit about this Lunch and Learn series and uh, how you can help build your practice and learn a little bit more about doing the business of medicine. Again, thank you for joining us today.